Welcome to Animation 101. This is a first course in animation for video based on the Amiga computer system. It's in two parts. The first part, we're going to get an introduction to the system and see some of the exciting animations that it's capable of doing. In the second part, we're going to go into detail on some of these animations that you've seen and show you exactly how they were made. And since the Amiga has a voice of its own, I'll let it introduce itself. Okay? Okay. But I saw what you did. I am an Amiga 2000 personal computer. My memory bank has been expanded to 5 megabytes. My speed has also been upgraded with an accelerator board. Why do they call you a 2000? I suppose it's my IQ. Oh, oh, oh. I can speak in a monotone like an ordinary computer. But why be ordinary when you can be special? Well, you still sound like a computer to me. Yes, but with a sound digitizer. Hold up a sound digitizer, please. Hey, how'd you do that? You're supposed to be the expert. You figure it out. Oh, yeah. Hold up a sound digitizer, please. With a sound digitizer. I can sound like anyone I choose. Hey, that's my voice. Disgusting, isn't it? Well, at least I have character. Well, why, you, you want character, Harvey? Well, well, how's this for character? Who said that? Well, I said that. What, what do you want, a, a program or something, for heaven's sakes? Not bad. In fact, that's pretty good. You want something really good? Come up and see me sometime. That's great. But we need to move on to something else now. Touch me there, big boy, and we're engaged. We really need to move on to something else now. Okay, maestro. You can select an instrument and play it on my keyboard. I like the flute. That's all right. Now I'm going to pick the string section. Let's try two instruments. An acoustic guitar on the top and a banjo on the bottom keys. Fun, but it's time to move on to the graphics. Wait, I haven't played any music. Lower your voice. I haven't played any music. Okay, we'll take time for one quick piece. shows off every chance he gets. It's what I do best. <laughs> I'm sure some people seeing this tape have never actually painted on a computer. So we're going to take just a quick minute here to show a few of the very basic fundamentals of painting on a computer. Most people paint with a mouse. Now if you're saying that doesn't look much like a mouse, okay, get yourself a dust cover to go on it and that'll help that illusion. I'm going to use a split screen to show how the mouse works. Ordinarily you paint by pressing the left mouse button and moving the mouse around. You can erase by pressing the right button. Or you can come down to the palette, select a different color, and you can paint with two different colors. These are the sizes of brush that you can select. Yeah, it's a smaller one. 
These are the basic tools that you have to work with. We've been freehand drawing. You can also draw a straight line by marking the two points and it automatically draws in between. Or you can, mark, or you can draw a curved line. You can draw a rectangle or a circle or almost anything like that, whatever you want. And you can fill an area. Let's, let's fill this one with brown. Or you can fill with a series of colors, a gradient fill. And we have a pumpkin. There are two other tools that I want to mention because they're very useful in uh, industrial videos and in almost any kind of animation programs. If you select the symmetrical tool, then everything that you paint will come out like a snowflake. And of course you can use the other tools along with that, like the fill, And if you happen to make a mistake, well, don't panic. Just hit the undo button, and it will undo the last thing you painted. You can also clear the screen. And if you do that accidentally, hit undo, and it will undo the clear. The other feature is color cycling. I'm sure you've seen moving lines. This is nothing more than color cycling. It's extremely useful in industrial programs. It can show the flow of hydraulic fluid in machinery. It can show radio signals from a tower. And it can show electric fields around a wire. These gears illustrate both tools. The teeth on each gear was painted with the help of the symmetrical tool. Now, I've picked up the whole thing as a brush, and now I'm going to paint a straight line with it. Now I'll turn on color cycling. You begin to get an idea of the power of some of these features. Company logos are very important to TV commercials and many types of video. Now it takes about five minutes to paint a logo like this. But once it's finished, it's easy to animate it, or change the size and fill the screen with it, or soften the colors and do a perspective. This makes a nice background for the original logo. So far we've been working in the standard paint mode in high resolution, which allows only 16 colors on the screen at a time. Now there's another paint mode called HAM, which stands for Hold and Modify, which allows 4,096 colors on the screen at a time. To illustrate, let's start with a digitized picture of the Grand Teton Mountains. We'll talk more about digitizing pictures in a minute. We could add fluffy white clouds to the sky for a cheerful mood. But let's see if we can completely change the mood of the scene. We'll add an overcast sky. and a little fog here and there. With a scene that spooky, we've got to have a monster.
So what do we have? The Loch Teton Monster. And what's a monster without a pterodactyl? We started this scene with a digitized photograph. There are a lot of ways to digitize pictures. There are frame grabbers and scanners, but the method that I use the most is called DigiView. As you can see, this is a black and white security type camera, but it will do color pictures because it uses a color filter wheel and it does a three color separation. You place the picture underneath it, turn on the lights, adjust it, and first you digitize the red. Then change to the green filter and digitize green. And then the blue. Now we can see it in full color. Of course, you can also digitize black and white pictures. Then you can add color. You can increase the blue and make it look like a moonlight scene. Or you can increase the red and make it look like a sunrise. Another feature that's particularly useful to us is the line drawing. And that's because a lot of animators still prefer to do their original drawings on tracing paper, the old-fashioned method. They're placed on the copy stand on standard animation pegs and digitized one at a time. After they're all digitized and saved on disk, then it's an easy matter to load them into a paint program, add color, and then set it in motion. And you can even add a background. And once we finish an animation, then we need some way to get it on videotape. And that's where the Genlock comes in. This is the one I use. It's called Super Gen. It has two sliders on it. One will fade the graphics in and out, the other will fade the background in and out. If you fade both of them together, then you have a dissolve. This is useful in a lot of ways. For example, in industrial videos, you can use graphics to show what happens inside machinery. It's also useful for home videos, like when your mother-in-law wants to see your vacation pictures, but you went to the French Riviera. How are you going to show that to your mother-in-law? With animation. Whew. Saved by the fig leaf. Now we're going to do a complete scene of animation, and this is going to be a tough one. You know, if you drive along in a car and look out the window, you see things moving by at different rates. Things in the distance will be going very slowly. Things up close will go fast. This is what gives it the feeling of depth. We're going to see now if we can get the same feeling of depth in an animation scene. First, we draw the background scene, the things off in the distance. Now we need some objects in the mid-range. And finally, some foreground objects.
Now let's put it in motion. Well, I think we got the feeling of depth in that. What we really need now is a cartoon character to move along in our scene. Now, if you happen to use Deluxe Paint 3, you've probably noticed a juggler on the cover. And strangely enough, he looks a lot like Dan Silva, the creator of, of uh, Deluxe Paint. Well, let's digitize the juggler, add color, do a little extra artwork here to make a series of it so we can animate it and then put him in the scene. Well, so much for the juggler. I played a dirty trick on him, though. I threw in a couple of extra obstacles. Well, I hope you're getting the idea now that you don't have to have a $100,000 computer system in order to do animation. As a matter of fact, with a personal computer like I have here, or even a smaller one, you can do a tremendous amount of animation right in your own home. As a matter of fact, you could even have your own TV station. Thank you for joining us. This is Ram 3 News, and I'm Scoop Richardson. Worldwide attention has been drawn to the pyramids of Egypt, where scientists have made a discovery which could shed new light on the origin of those pyramids. For that story, we go to our foreign reporter in Egypt, Abdul Richardson. Abdul? Thank you, Scoop. I'm standing here at the edge of the Great Sahara Desert. And believe me, these pyramids are magnificent. Scientists have just made a new discovery here. They've discovered a new chamber in one of these pyramids, and the chamber contains hieroglyphics never before seen. They say it may be weeks before they can decipher the true meaning of these strange characters. We'll follow this story closely until we can understand the true impact of this story. Reporting from Egypt, this is Abdul Richardson. Uh-oh, the camera's moving. Somebody grab the camera. Look out. Hold it. Oh, forget it. I'm out of here. We apologize for the technical difficulties in bringing you that story. On the national news, a mystery is unfolding in South Dakota in the vicinity of Mount Rushmore. Several tourists have reported hearing strange sounds drifting down from the mountain. We have a crew on the scene there. They're going to zoom in with their cameras onto the mountain along with the long-range microphone and see if we can pick up anything. Where's the team that can't be beat? Who are the guys they can't defeat? We're talking about dudes with lots of sense. It's got to be us, the presidents. Well, all right. Well, all right. I think I heard something, but I couldn't be sure. What will the weather be like? Wendy Richardson is standing by outdoors, where the weather is happening. Wendy? That's right, Scoop. This is where it's happening. Today's weather picture is a puzzle, any way you look at it. But after analyzing all the information, the pieces are finally beginning to fit together. There's a thunderstorm sweeping across the western plains. A twister has been sighted on the ground. Fortunately, the only injuries reported have been dislocated hips and a few damaged eardrums. And I'm not sure what that is, but it looks like a very large snake crawling from coast to coast. But the thing that gives us the greatest concern at this time is the entire nation is being pelted with baseball size white numbers. Wendy's weather has the seal of approval of the Meteor Illogical Society. Turning now to the local news, the giant ape, Bing Bong, is on the loose again and is creating havoc in the downtown area.
That wraps up the news for today. I'm Scoop Richardson for Ram 3 News. When the news counts, count on Ram 3. Well, if television is not your thing, what you really want to do is make a movie. Go ahead. trying to communicate with music. Music, I can do that. My mission on this planet's complete. Okay, Scotty, beam me up. Ooh, that tickles, but it sure beats riding the bus. Well, this brings us to the close of part one. I hope you've enjoyed it because I've really enjoyed bringing it to you. All the animations that you have seen were done in real time, no single frame recording, so that they can go to any VCR. Now I realize we've left a lot of questions unanswered, but in part two we're going to take a more detailed look at these same animations, give you some tips on how they were done. See you soon. In part one, we explored a lot of different animation techniques, and we had a little fun with it. Now in part two, we're going to get serious. We'll take one topic at a time, beginning with video editing. We'll start with the beam me up effect. To paint the beam, pick a color that's in a cycle, select airbrush, press F7, and give it a burst of colors. Now pick that up and use it as a brush. Run the background scene and spray the beam everywhere it's needed to cover the subject. Now let's see the finished product. Fade in the beam using the genlock. Now the guy has to get out of there somehow. And fade the beam out. Not very effective. We need to get rid of the middle section with video editing. That's better. 
animation is memory intensive. It takes a lot of memory for every scene that we do. Now, generally speaking, one scene is about all we can hold in memory at a time, and not a very long one at that. Fortunately, videotape gives us the means to assemble a lot of scenes together to make a longer program. Now, this is a U-Matic three-quarter inch videotape cassette. You can't see the image recorded on videotape, but if you could see it, it would look something like this. A control track along one edge, two soundtracks along the opposite edge, and the pictures recorded in the middle in the form of long diagonal lines. This is a very basic editing system for professionals. This is the source playback machine and the monitor to go with it. This is the recorder and the monitor to go with it. And in between, there's a computerized unit that controls both machines. There are two types of video editing, assembly and insert. When assembly editing is used, everything on the tape is erased and the new scene is recorded, complete with control track, picture, and soundtracks. When insert editing is used, it will record a new picture, either soundtrack, or any combination of the three, but it does not record the control track. The control track must be recorded in advance. The way to record a control track is to hook up a camera, but leave the lens cap on so you won't get any picture, and unplug the microphone if you can so you won't get any sound. Then turn on the recorder. Normally, the control track is recorded the full length of the tape. Then the tape is clearly marked so it won't be erased accidentally. And use a new tape because it'll erase anything that might have been previously recorded on it. Insert editing is the preferred method. The reason is because the control track is recorded uninterrupted. The edits are likely to be smoother. The title at the beginning of this tape appears as though the letters are being written onto the chalkboard. This is called a scratch-on, and we work backwards to do that. We start with the full title. I actually use chalk to do the lettering on black cardboard. Then digitized it with DigiView and added it to the drawing of the chalkboard. Save the complete picture on disk. Then we want to use the animation features of Deluxe Paint. We'll go to the menu bar and select Anim, Frames, Add Frame. Now we can see that we're on frame number two, and there are only two frames in our animation. So we press one to go back to frame number one. Let's choose a fairly large brush and erase a little bit of the last number. There. Now we want to add another frame. To do that, we don't have to go back to the menu bar. We can just press the A key, because that stands for again, and it will repeat the last command we did. Now we're on frame two, and there are three frames in our animation. We want to go back to frame one, so we press the number one key. Then scratch off a little more, and repeat. A, add a frame. One, back up one frame, erase a little more. We can look at our animation any time by pressing the 5 key. That looks pretty good, so we'll go back to where we were, to frame number 1. Continue to repeat this cycle until the entire title has been erased. It took me 88 frames altogether. Be sure to save it on disk. You don't have to save individual frames. You can save the entire animation as an anim, and it takes a lot less disk space. After it's safely saved on disk, press the 5 key and look at the finished animation. The 5 key will play the animation one time and hold on the last frame. When you look at pictures painted in the ham mode, you might wonder why would anybody go back to the standard paint mode. Sure, ham pictures can be beautiful, but there are limitations. 
you give up color cycling. But the greatest drawback for animators is the excessive amount of memory that they use, generally too much for real-time animation. Ah, but don't overlook ham pictures for background scenes. The pterodactyl was painted in the standard paint mode and added to a ham background with a genlock. We saw one way to create a ham picture by digitizing a photograph. Another way is with 3D solid modeling and ray tracing programs. Or we can simply import a picture from a standard paint program and enhance it with ham. There are basically two types of motion, constant speed and variable speed. We'll illustrate the two types by moving an object from point A to point B. In constant speed, we can simply divide the distance into equal segments so that the ball moves the same distance on every frame. In motion, it looks like a ping pong ball. In reality, not many things move that way. Most things start moving slowly and build up speed, and they slow down before coming to a halt. This is called slow in and slow out. This is what variable speed motion looks like. You can see the difference. When animating objects or characters, we must know whether their motion is constant speed or variable speed. So we'll know how the spacing should be. I said earlier that some animators prefer to do their original drawings on tracing paper. That's so they can see through several layers and see how the action is progressing. Now there are several software programs that'll do about the same thing. One program shows the current drawing in black and the previous three layers in shades of gray. We can do the same thing with deluxe paint, but we have to do it manually. First, we set up the palette. I find it's easier on the eyes to use a medium gray background rather than white. The next color should be black because that's the one we'll use for drawing. We could use shades of gray like tracing paper or we could improve on the system using soft colors. The colors that work best for me are 669, 1566, 5105 and all the rest eights like the background. The next step is to make a cycle of all colors, including the background. Now we're ready to draw. This overweight mouse is named Josh, and he was created by my good friend Chet Taylor. The current drawing is always in black. Add a frame. On frame two, we want the original drawing to be a lighter color, so here are the steps. Turn on the grid, pick up the drawing as a brush, and position the brush directly over the drawing. The grid makes it easy to do. Press F5 to turn on shading. And press the left mouse button to shade the drawing. When the brush is removed, we see that the drawing has shifted to the next lower color on the palette. Now we can turn off the grid and press F2 to turn off shading. Paint the next drawing in black. Repeat the same steps for each new drawing. A to add a frame, turn on the grid, Pick up the drawings and position them, F5 for shading, and paint. Every time we do this, all the colors on the screen shift downward one color on the palette. After all the drawings are complete, we'll erase everything except the black lines, but that's easy to do. Bring up the stencil requester, select black, and make. This will protect all the black lines so they can't be erased. Select clear all frames. After it finishes clearing all frames except for the black lines, turn off the stencil and the series of drawings is complete. Now that we know how to make the drawings in sequence, I'm going to complicate things by saying we don't always make drawings in sequence. In fact, usually we make the key drawings first and then the in-betweens. Now it takes 16 frames to do a complete walk cycle. And when it's played back, uh, the cycle's repeated over and over so that it looks like he's walking continuously. Let's analyze these 16 frames. 
In frame one, Josh is in full stride with the right foot in front. Halfway through the cycle, frame nine, he will again be in full stride, but this time the left foot is in front. And if you notice, these two frames are identical, except for a few lines. In animation, we can often reduce the amount of work by duplicating a drawing and making some minor changes in it. So one and nine are key frames. The only other key frame will be five, halfway between one and nine. This is where the leg is straight down. In the walk cycle, there are four motions that we should create. The first is body bounce. The head and body change very little, if at all, except that they bounce up and down with every step. When Josh is in full stride, the head and body are in their lowest position. When one leg is straight down, the head and body are in their highest position. Other frames show a gradual change of position. The second movement we're concerned about is foot and leg movement. Each foot will move at a constant speed while it's on the ground, so a simple ground guide will help. Make a mark under the middle of each foot. Then divide this distance into eight equal moves. Draw one foot through the complete walk cycle and connect the foot to the body with the right leg. And speaking of saving work, the complete cycle of the right leg can be picked up as an anim brush and be used with the stencil to paint the left leg. The third motion is the tail whipping up and down in reaction to the body bounce. The end of the tail follows the body up and down about two frames later. The final motion is the arm swing. The arms swing back and forth like a pendulum. So we can draw the first nine frames of the right arm, then pick them up and use them in reverse order for the last half of the cycle. We can use these same drawings for the left arm by utilizing the stencil and by modifying the hands slightly. This completes the walk sequence. It's a good idea to save both color and black and white versions. The color walk sequence should also be saved as an anim brush. Now the background. Did you notice that the background scene is only a single drawing with color cycling? Well, it is. Let's erase the moving floor and do it again. We'll make a cycle out of the last eight colors in the palette. By the way, this palette does not have to be the same one that we used in the Josh Walk animation because we're going to record it on videotape separately. Then when it's played back into the Genlock, Josh will be added. Select the largest square brush and enlarge it more by pressing the plus key several times. Select the first color in the cycle. Press F7 so the brush will cycle through the colors. Paint a series of colors side by side. Pick up the series as a brush and be careful not to include any of the background color. Select Effects, Perspective, Center. And place the point of infinity about where you estimate the horizon to be in the background scene. Select FX, Perspective, Do. Position it in the middle of the floor area and press Shift and number 7 on the numerical keypad. This rotates it 90 degrees and makes it appear to lie on the floor. We can move the brush around now and see the perspective at work. Bring up the Fill Requester and select Brush, Perspective, and OK. Hide the toolbox and fill the floor area. After the floor is completely filled, it's time to set the colors the way we want them. Background colors work best if they're very soft. The Amiga computer has a reputation for harsh, oversaturated colors, but we don't have to use them that way. We have the tools to soften them as much as we want. 
The first four colors in the cycle should be identical, and the last four should be identical, but slightly different from the first four. Set the cycle speed and direction, and the background scene is finished. The moving background is one of the important basic moves in animation. And usually, color cycling just won't do it. The background has to actually move. Unfortunately, most of the animation software programs have no provision for a moving background. One program that does have that is Deluxe Video 3, and it can move the background in any direction and any speed. The hieroglyphic scene was done that way. The scene was created with Deluxe Paint by setting the page size to the maximum width, which is 1,008, and the height to overscan, which is 480. The entire picture area is available for painting by using the cursor keys to scroll it around. The picture was saved on disk and loaded into Deluxe Video. The movement was controlled by a scroll requester. It was set to move one pixel on the x-axis every two jiffies. The term jiffy came into use strictly for computer animation, and it means simply one half frame of video or one sixtieth of a second. Two jiffies equals one frame of video or one thirtieth of a second. When the scene is played back, the scroll is very smooth. All the animations in this program, except one, are in high resolution. Now, I strongly recommend high resolution for any animations that are made for professional use. And the reason is simple, because low res looks amateurish. If we want our work to be accepted by professionals, we have to meet their standards, which means not only high resolution, but also overscan. Now, the one scene in this program that's in low res is the juggler. Because of the complexity of the scene and the length of it, it took all five megabytes in this computer just to do it in low res, even without overscan. But that's all right, because it's only a, a training exercise. Before starting a scene this complex, we should organize the palette. Let's reserve the first column of eight colors for the juggler. The last column of eight colors will be reserved for the foreground objects, so we can make a stencil out of them. That leaves the middle 16 colors for background and midground objects. It'll be easier in the long run if we paint all the parts first, then we can assemble the scene without interruption. The background is painted first and saved as a low-res picture. Now we can fix the background, paint each object, pick it up, and save it as a brush. The juggler will be an eight-frame anim brush. Free the background, clear the screen, and make the first drawing of the juggler. Press Shift-J to copy it onto the spare page. Erase everything that will be in motion, leaving only the head, body, and unicycle. Set the frame number to 8. Go to frame 1, then the spare page, and copy the full drawing onto frame 1. It's probably easier to draw the leg positions if all eight drawings are laid out on the spare page. Then they can be picked up one at a time and placed on the proper frame. The balls are next. Pick up one ball, fix the background, and paint the new balls halfway between the old ones. If we flip through the pages, it looks like the new balls are painted on all frames, but don't be confused by that. They're not actually painted on any of the background frames. To help understand what's going on, think of it this way. When we fix the background, it's as though we create a new foreground screen to work on, completely separate from the background screen. Then we can flip through pages on the background screen without affecting what we've painted on the foreground. This is another powerful tool that makes life easier for the animator. 
Now we can place the balls that we painted on the foreground screen anywhere we want them. Go to frame 5, free the background, and now the balls are a permanent part of that frame. The balls and arms can be painted on the rest of the frames the same way. Pick up the juggler sequence as an anim brush and save it on disk. Do you remember when the juggler went through the loop? This same juggler anim brush can now be used to create the 360 degree loop. Clear all frames and set the number to 32. Go to frame one. Paint the first frame, undo, and go to the move requester. We want it to rotate minus 360 degrees on the Z axis in 32 frames. When complex objects like this are rotated, the lines are quite rough, especially in low res. It would be a major project to manually clean up all lines on all frames, but in an important animation, it might be worth the effort. These 32 frames are now picked up and saved as an anim brush. Now that all the parts are finished, we can start assembling our scene. What we're going to do is make two copies of this background and attach them together to form a very wide background. Pick up the entire background. Clear the screen. Select Anim Frame Set Number and set the number to 200. Press Alternate and X to move the handle to the bottom corner of the brush. With the brush handle in the lower right corner, position the background as far down and to the right as it will go. It should cover the entire screen. Paint it there and press the U key to undo it. The computer remembers where you placed it and will begin its move from there. Select Anim Move. We'll move the background minus 200 pixels on the X axis in 200 frames. That'll be a very slow move. It'll take a few seconds to paint on all the frames. When it's finished, we're ready to paint the second copy of the background to fill in all of the blank areas. Go to frame one, press alternate and X to put the handle in the lower left corner of the brush, and repeat the same steps that we took with the first copy. But now when the brush handle is moved to the corner, the picture is completely off the screen. Don't worry, if you paint it there, the computer knows where it is and will start the move from there. Again, it takes a few seconds to paint all the frames. But when it's finished, we can press the 5 key and watch the move. Before proceeding, we should save all 200 frames as an anim. It'll take three or four disks if you don't have a hard drive. The midground objects are added. Midground objects should move faster than the background. In this case, minus 400 pixels in 200 frames. What we're doing is painting two-dimensional objects and moving them at different speeds to create a three-dimensional effect. Let's go one step farther and add perspective to an object, like a garden, for example. Let's see what happens. Yes, we can combine perspective with the move requester, and the result is a very effective illusion of depth. Foreground objects move much faster, minus 400 pixels in 50 frames. When the background scene is finished, save it on disk, and we're ready to add the juggler. Load the juggler anim brush. We want him to start off by going behind the tree, so bring up the stencil requester. Select the last eight colors and make. From now on, we can turn the stencil on and off by pressing the tilde key. But for now, leave it on. Paint him on frame one and undo. Set the Z distance to plus 64 to move him away from us. It's always a good idea to preview before drawing. After the first cycle of eight frames is painted, we can go directly to the move requester by pressing the A key. We don't have to position the brush anymore.
from now on, just tell the move requester what to do, and each new move will be a continuation of the previous move. One more time to get him clear of the tree. Now minus 64 to bring him back to the starting distance. Turn off the stencil so he can go in front of the post and continue with whatever you want him to do. When we get to the loop, we'll need to add 32 frames by selecting Anim Frames Set Number and change it to 232. Load the juggler 360 Anim Brush. We'll need to position each frame manually. Here are some tips that will be helpful when working with Anim Brushes. To paint a single frame, hold down the alternate key first, then the Commodore key. Or if you want to paint several frames, hold down the Commodore key and then the alternate key. It'll keep painting frame after frame as long as you hold down both keys. This works with both a single brush and an anim brush. The Commodore key and the right alternate key work the same way to erase the brush from one or more frames. With this basic understanding of the move requester, you should be ready to finish up the scene in any way that you like. When we synchronize a voice with a cartoon character to make it look like he's talking, we're getting into more advanced animation. It's called lip sync, and there are many ways to do it. The best method for any individual will depend on his talents and the equipment at his disposal. We're going to cover one of the methods used in this video. You may choose to develop your own variations. For the talking computer, the first step is to develop a face that fits the type of character that you have in mind. The next step was to draw mouth shapes which represented the basic sounds of conversation. In addition to his normal smug mouth, we need a plain mouth with closed lips for the beginning of B, P, and M sounds. We also need mouth shapes for A, A, E, A, O, U, F. These 14 mouth shapes can be arranged to say anything. Recording the voice is next, and it's found on the Workbench Extras disc under Basic Demos, Speech. I'm sure you've played with it many times. Do you want me to demonstrate? No, I think we've heard enough. Who asked you? <laughs> Did you ever see a computer that argued with itself? <laughs> I record the sound directly on videotape. There's a trick that I've learned that's very helpful. Using a camera, record the VU meter at the same time. The reason for taping the VU meter is to give us a visual cue for every sound. It makes the soundtrack much easier to read. This is going to be terrific. When using a person's voice, videotape his face and use his own lip movement for the visual cues. That, uh, what do you want, a, a program or something for heaven's sakes? Before reading the soundtrack, we'll need some blank forms, which are combination cue sheets for sound on the left and exposure sheets for picture on the right. Each line represents one frame, and each column represents one second. Video editing recorders usually have a search knob and a counter that reads in seconds and frames. If yours doesn't have that, you may be able to count frames as you go. Find the beginning of the first word, where the needle just starts to move. Back up one frame, and reset the counter to zero. Write the first syllable on the cue sheet at zero frames. 
Continue reading each syllable or sound and marking it on the cue sheet at the right frame count. In most situations, dialogue can be shot on twos. In other words, each cell or each mouth position can be held for two frames. So we'll mark only the even numbered frames on the exposure sheet side. Now all the hard work is already done. The rest is easy. Page Flipper Plus is a very simple animation program that's perfectly suited for this type of work. We want to do a new scene. All of our pictures are on this disk. Now it's just a matter of following the exposure sheet and selecting the pictures in the right order. Page Flipper Plus makes a list of the ones we choose. When the list is complete, it will show the full script. The duration of each frame is four jiffies. That's right, because we're shooting on twos. On the last frame, we want to add single step mode on, so it will hold on the last frame. And here we want single step mode off, so it'll play at normal speed again. Select make and wait while it loads all frames. Once again, we'll skip through this just to save time. When we select play, it shows the first frame and holds until we press the left mouse button to start. One time through, then the single step mode takes over. One click to go back to the beginning and another click to start the animation again. When these scenes were taped, the computer did not really speak. It merely mouthed the words. Then the voice was added by insert editing. If you don't have access to video editing equipment, you can still do lip sync by digitizing the sound and then playing it back through an animation program that will play back both sound and picture. There are several good ones to choose from. Deluxe Video 3 and Cell Animator are a couple. That brings us to the close of Animation 101, Part 2. We haven't covered all the details of all the animations. That would be impossible in a single program. I have tried to cover enough background so that you can fill in the rest of the blanks by yourself. And of course, this is only a first course in animation. Uh, after you learn these basics and master them, you'll be ready for more advanced techniques, like higher resolution, like millions of colors. With the Amiga system, the sky is the limit. Isn't that right? Tell me about it. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Good luck and good animating.